Let me share with you three things that I love about this conference. The first thing I love is the embrace of complexity. This is a conference about food, but again and again we've heard that it's not just about food. Food is an entry point to a larger complex of human needs and environmental limits and planetary boundaries, all of which we need to consider in toto, and we embrace that complexity. That is exemplified by this picture of the so-called uh, donut from Donut Economics by Kate Raworth. And that's the second thing I love, the fact that this recurring metaphor at a conference on food uses one of the most disgusting items of food ever invented, the donut. You have to love the irony. <laughs> the third thing I love is that we are very solutions focused. We've heard on the path to healthy and sustainable is the new normal, the name of this session, business solutions. We've heard government policy solutions. We've heard innovative technology. But I think we've heard a little less about that complex of knowledge, attitudes, and behavior, of history, identity, and aspirations that comprises culture. Culture change is part of the job in making healthy and sustainable the new normal. And that's what I'd like to talk about for the next few minutes. But I'm going to begin talking about uh, culture change by showing you this picture. This is Ritz Mock Apple Pie. Does this look familiar to anybody? Only a few hands are going up. There's no reason you should know about it. It's called mock apple pie, but despite the word apple in the title, it contains not one bit of apple. In fact, it contains nothing that's remotely edible, except for a little bit of lemon juice. The foundational ingredient is Ritz crackers, which are little slabs of highly processed material. Now, why am I showing you this? Well, a lot of people have already talked about their family backgrounds, their family meals when they were children. Gunhild shared that, Sandra shared that, others have shared that. True confession, when I was a kid, my mother served mock apple pie to my brother and my father and me. We ate it at the family dinner table. You might wonder what it tasted like, more like building material than like food, but it also tasted like love. It tasted like family time together. It tasted like security and predictability. My point here is that patterns of sustainable and healthy or unsustainable and unhealthy behavior can be deeply embedded in and identified with culture. And so changing these things requires culture change. Think about how much culture has to do with the levels of sustainability and healthfulness in our lives. Think about music, for example. I'm going to use Bruce Springsteen as an example. Why is that? Well, you should always talk about Bruce Springsteen if you have the chance. Maybe you noticed the big poster of him on the way over from the hotel to here. If you've listened to his lyrics or if you've looked at his album covers, you'll know that the automobile is ubiquitous in his work. And I'm not talking about Priuses. I'm talking about big, powerful cars whose engines rev and that drive very fast. But this is not just about the profligate burning of fossil fuels. This is about independence, and rebellion, and coolness, and romance. Sustainability decisions tied up with culture. Think about urbanization, cities, the widespread cultural meme of bright lights, big city. Now this is not just about the excessive use of electrical power to light up a city beyond where it needs to be lit. This is also about mystery, opportunity, edginess, Again, patterns that have to do with sustainability and health wrapped up in larger cultural norms. And think about food, the topic that brings us all here. This picture is not just about gluttonous consumption of unsustainably produced food. It's also about friendship. It's about belonging. It's about fun. So again and again, we are reminded that the decisions we make, the practices we undertake that either are or are not healthy and sustainable are embedded in culture. And that means we need to be talking about culture change if we want to make healthy and sustainable the new normal. Now, the good news is things can change. Here's an example. In every major combatant nation in the First and Second World Wars, within a period of months, large segments of the populations began growing fruits and vegetables at home and making those fruits and vegetables an important part of their diet. Exactly what we're talking about urging people to do now. Now, that was a tragic reason, but the lesson, change can happen. Think about LGBT rights, marriage equality. Unthinkable less than a generation ago, normative in many places now. Change can happen. Think about Facebook, 
which went from non-existent to having two billion active users around the world in the space of a decade, upending normative patterns of communication and belief formation. Change can happen. Well, if culture change can happen, and if that has to be a part of our approach to making healthy and sustainable the new normal, how do we do it? Well, I don't know. I'm not an expert in culture change. I'm a doctor. But I do want to raise some questions rather than pretend to offer answers. So I'll, range a, I'll, I'll raise a few questions and hope that these will inform our debate as we go forward. First, how do we reckon with the need to defend belief systems? We've learned a lot in recent years from behavioral economics and cognitive psychology about how people form and defend their beliefs. And the short answer is, they defend their beliefs ferociously. Beliefs are mostly influenced by what friends and family and members of one's in-group think. Most people, when confronted with facts that challenge their beliefs, don't renovate their beliefs, they dismiss the facts. How do we frame and present and discuss health and sustainability in situations where people feel that those things may challenge their belief system so that we can move forward with making those things the new normal? Second, how do we reckon with tribalism? The world is being torn apart these days by tribalism. We're seeing nativist, nationalist, populist movements in many countries. We're seeing far too many armed conflicts. We're seeing political discourse in many countries looking more like tribal warfare than like civil discourse. Well, if we are to make healthy and sustainable the new normal, we will only do that by ourselves and our fellow citizens thinking about collective solutions in the spirit of solidarity, not thinking about uh, tribal self-interest in the spirit of combat. How do we achieve that at a time when that's not the prevailing tone of discourse? Third, what about this issue of self-interest versus altruism? There are some who think that the best way to make change is to appeal to people's self-interest. My predecessor here on the stage, uh, coming from a business perspective, made exactly that point just a few minutes ago. Others believe that people have uh, generosity, altruism, principle, driving what they do at least some of the time. Probably both things are true. Probably both things are true in the same person over the course of minutes. To what extent can we deploy self-interest? To what extent can we deploy altruism? One of the answers is unconventional partnerships. I'm really delighted that Martin Palmer will be up here on the stage in a few minutes talking about organized religion as a potential partner to making healthy and sustainable the new normal. If you want to read a great piece, a highly influential piece about healthy and sustainable eating, read Pope Francis's Laudato Si, published a couple of years ago. It is a great piece about sustainable food masquerading as a tract about reverence and generosity and faith and equity. There really seems to be a role for morality and organized religion may be a great vehicle for that. Next, how do we reckon with the need for hope? People need to feel hope. We've all heard a lot of grim news in the last couple of days and most of us are attentive enough that we take in grim news all the time and this may be how it makes us feel. But hope is an absolute necessity. We can't sell change without hope. How do we maintain the spirit of, of kinetic optimism that has uh, characterized this meeting? And how do we broadcast that optimism so that others will feel it too, moving us toward making uh, healthy and sustainable the new normal? What about the need for narrative? Now, for somebody like me who's an evidence junkie, for the scientists in the audience, this is going to come as tough news. But Evidence doesn't always drive decisions. People love stories, people need stories. In the same way that speakers speak and listeners listen, numbers numb. That's why they're called numbers, that's what they do. Numbers numb, but stories stick. How do we take the best evidence we have about what's healthy to eat, what's sustainable to eat, what are the best ways to make energy and travel and build buildings and design cities, and turn those into the kinds of stories that stick and motivate change? Finally, what can we learn from social marketing? Social marketing is the use of techniques of public education and persuasion borrowed from the advertising world 
used in the service of positive social goals. We in public health have done a lot of social marketing over the years. We're the ones who tell you to be more physically active and eat less food and quit smoking and wear a condom, sometimes all at the same time. And we've learned a lot about how to get those messages across. One of my favorite maxims from social marketing is if you want to achieve behavior change, make it fun, make it easy, make it popular. Make it fun, make it easy, make it popular. If we can convey that being healthy and sustainable is fun, if we can truly make those things easy, if there's enough buzz, if it's popular enough that it's a party everybody wants to come to, then we're moving down the road toward making healthy and sustainable the new normal. Well, the path to healthy and sustainable is a long and winding one. Uh, we need all the tools in our toolbox to walk down that path and be successful. Let's not forget that one of those tools, perhaps one of the most important tools, is culture change. Culture change that is effective, that is strategic, and that is fearless. Thank you.